Amen. Friends, before the sermon this morning, I hope you'll permit me a moment of personal privilege. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the summer that my wife, the Reverend Elizabeth Duffin, will soon begin serving as the senior pastor at First United Methodist Church in Missouri City. For the past five and a half years, her work has been outside of the local church, so we've had the privilege to worship together at Bel Air UMC every Sunday. Well, next week, Elizabeth begins her tenure at Missouri City, and that means that today is our last Sunday as a one church family. And and I cannot express my gratitude for all the ways you have loved us so well these years. Of course, I'm not going anywhere and you'll still see Elizabeth and the kids all the time, but I'm wistful today nonetheless. Elizabeth also has a few words she'd like to say. So here she is. Well, good morning, Bel Air UMC. It's Elizabeth Duffin here. Today is a bittersweet day for me because today is my last Sunday to be in worship with you all. For the past five and a half years, you have opened your hearts and your lives to me and I have been so grateful. You have been generous to me, treating me as one of your pastors, even though I haven't been officially. You welcomed our family of three and celebrated when we became a family of four. As a clergy couple, Sean and I never could have imagined that we would get to spend most Sundays together with a congregation that we love so much. Next Sunday, I will begin my appointment as the senior pastor of First United Methodist Church in Missouri City. It's a great church with lots of great people and great ministry, and I am so excited about what God has in store for me there. And I'm excited because my going to be pastor there means that Sean gets to keep being pastor at Bel Air, and we get the double blessing of being a part of two great churches. So today is bittersweet because while I am so excited about what is next, I have so loved what has been. This is not goodbye, but a see you soon. Thanks, Bel Air. We really do love you all. We are so grateful that God has brought us together, and we thank you for your prayers as we enter this new season in our family's life. So as we continue to worship together this morning, let's pray. God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power so that your spirit will move within us, to open us up, to open our ears and our eyes, our hearts and our minds, so that we'll hear a word from you. And God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We're finishing up our staycation series this morning. We've been talking about the idea that as God's people, we are called to live life on mission which means that we don't need to go anywhere to do God's work. We can do it in the very place we live with the very people God has placed closest to us. I've been showing you this map. It's a three-mile radius around our church here at the corner of Bel Air and Newcastle. This is the place that God has put us. The people who live inside that circle are the people that God has placed closest to us. And in this place, among these people, we have a purpose as a church. In the United Methodist Church, we've got particular language to talk about purpose. We say that our purpose is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That is, our purpose is to be ever-growing as disciples of Jesus. People who each day are becoming more and more and more like Jesus compassionate like Jesus is compassionate, truthful in the way that Jesus is truthful, gracious, loving, and generous in the same way that Jesus is gracious, loving, and generous. To be disciples, to help others be disciples so that the world can be transformed. That's how we narrate our purpose in the United Methodist Church, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The Apostle Paul uses different language, but he has the same thing in mind. The way he says it is that living life on mission, our purpose is to proclaim the good news of Jesus. 
to proclaim the good news of Jesus. The good news that Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. That Jesus came into the world not just to judge our sins, but to forgive our sins. So that we can be made whole. So that we can have flourishing relationships with God and with others, and thus, so that the world we live in today can become more like the world God intends for it to be. And the scripture that will guide us this morning is from Acts chapters 18 and 19. It's from Paul's third missionary journey, and it shows us that there's really only one thing we need to fulfill our purpose as God's people in the world. So let's read it. If you've got your Bible open, it's, uh, or if you've got your Bible with you, open up to Acts chapter 18. You can also find the scripture text printed in this morning's digital worship guide. So here we go, starting in verse 24. Now there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Let's pause there and notice a couple of things. So the narrative starts with some information about a man named Apollos. He was a contemporary of the Apostle Paul and was likewise a popular evangelist and preacher. And we get a sense from this passage that he was a charismatic communicator. He was eloquent and spoke with burning enthusiasm, it says. The author of Acts tells us several other things about Apollos as well. He was well-versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and this meant that he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And he was able to accurately teach those things about Jesus to others. I hope you're hearing some of this discipleship language in here. He himself is learning to live as a disciple, and he is helping others to do the same. But notice how the introduction to Apollos ends. Though he knew only the baptism of John. That's important, so keep it in mind because it will come up again in the passage. Let's keep reading. Verse 26. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. Notice that for all the gifts that Apollos had, for all the scripture and theology he knew, there was still room for him to grow. There was still room for him to gain a fuller understanding of God and God's work in his life and in the world. And that happened through Priscilla and Aquila, two leaders in the Ephesian church. And this growth in Apollo, this change, this transformation in Apollos led to even greater fruit for God's kingdom. Here's what happens next. And when he wished to cross over to Achaia, the believers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. On his arrival, he greatly helped those who through through grace had become believers. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. And now we have a switch in scenes and in focus. We move away from what's happening with Apollos and toward what's happening with a whole group of believers that Paul encounters. This is chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, into what were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Remember what we had learned about Apollos, that he knew only the baptism of John? We find the same thing here, a group of disciples who knew only John's baptism. We're talking about John the Baptist when we say John's baptism. And John the Baptist was something of a precursor to Jesus. And what John said all along was that he was simply preparing the way. Preparing the way for Jesus who was more powerful. Who would baptize not just with water but with the Holy Spirit. That's the key. Because as powerful as John's baptism may have been, it was missing one thing. The Holy Spirit. Back to the story. Verse 4, Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, this pandemic and quarantine living has really helped me to develop some bad habits. Specifically, I stay up too late, I eat too much popcorn, and I watch too much TV. And here's what happens. We'll get the kids to bed, we'll turn on whatever show we're watching on Netflix or Amazon Prime, and and I'll get a bag of popcorn. But sometimes it it feels like the pop secret people have underfilled the bag and there's just not enough there. So, So I'll finish the bag and I'll say, you know what, just one more. And an hour later, I'll be falling asleep as we finish an episode of The Great British Baking Show, and and I'll rouse myself awake and I'll say, you know what, let's watch just one more. And and I know that that's mostly gluttony on my part, but, but there's something there, because in our story this morning, for Apollos and for the disciples that Paul encounters, all they needed, all they needed was one more thing Turned out to be a big thing, but all they needed was one more thing. They knew, Apollos and these unnamed disciples, they knew John's baptism. Which meant that they knew the reality of sin in their lives. They knew they weren't perfect. They knew they needed a savior. And they knew that Jesus was that savior, but they were missing something. All of them, and what they were missing was the Holy Spirit. The disciples that Paul encountered, when he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They say, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And I'm afraid that might be too true for many people today. I'm afraid that it might be true for us sometimes today, that we don't even know that the Holy Spirit is ready to change our lives. We don't recognize that the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into deeper love of God, that the Holy Spirit wants to shape us into people who more clearly reflect Jesus into the world, that the Holy Spirit will use us to transform that world. So this this morning, I want to make sure that our church is not forgetting the one thing. I want to make sure that you are not forgetting the one thing that makes it possible for us to proclaim the good news of Jesus that makes it possible to be disciples who transform the world. I want to make sure that we are not forgetting the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Christian tradition, and probably for some of you, the Holy Spirit conjures up all these nebulous images, like wind blowing through the trees or or some other really hard-to-pin-down image. And that's not an accident, because there is deep mystery to the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. But the Holy Spirit is critical to the Christian life. The Holy Spirit is the power and presence of God. We cannot do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's power and presence in your life. And in the world at large, and this is important because we usually think that what will make the difference is if I work more, if I try harder, if I do better, then life can be different. Then I can be different. But that's just not true. Our resources will give out. We do not have within us what we need to change our lives or to change the world. Only God can do that. The reality of human life is that I cannot save myself. My heart is too selfish to give itself for others all on its own. We cannot transform the world or ourselves by ourselves. Only God can do that. But God can do exactly that. God can transform the world. God can transform you. And God does it by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're living on mission right here, right now. Our mission is to proclaim the good news, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And we're beginning to see that we do not need to have all the resources by ourselves. We don't have all the resources by ourselves. We need one more thing, the Holy Spirit. And this is my deep desire for you and for our church, that here at the corner of Bel Air and Newcastle and right where you are today, that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Because we can work as hard as we can. We can know as much about the Bible as it's possible to know. We can be theologically correct in every possible way. We can make right decision after right decision after right decision. But if we don't have the Holy Spirit, if we don't have the power and presence of God in our lives, then our lives and our world will never be transformed. They will never become what God intends for them to be. So here's what I'm asking you to do for yourself and for our church. Pray that you will receive the Holy Spirit. I know, I know that for some of you, this feels way outside your comfort zone. But each week during this series, I've given you some homework. In week one, it was to think about and to name how you have experienced the goodness of God. In week two, it was to actively pray for the people who live closest to you And today, week three, I want you to pray for the Holy Spirit. I want you to pray that you will receive the Holy Spirit, that our church will be filled with the Holy Spirit in a real and powerful way. Here's why. There are things in this world that only God can change. And there are things in your life that only God can change. And the only way that'll happen, the only way we can truly live our purpose and proclaim the good news about Jesus in this place or in any place is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So right here, right now, I'd like you to pray with me. I'd like you to pray with me using the words on the screen. God of grace and God of glory. On your people, pour your power. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit so that our lives might be changed for the better, so that we might be generous like Jesus is generous, compassionate like he is compassionate, truthful, gracious, and loving, just like Jesus. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit so that our church might be changed for the better growing in generosity, compassion, grace, and love. Empower us to proclaim the good news of Jesus in this place and to the people around us so that our city, our country, our world might be changed for the better and become what you intend for it to be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 